welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me, and of course, you know, I'm going to say the fabulous Christopher. Chris, who we've got on today? Hi, Alina. I thought the thing is we've, we have done a few serious ones and we've we've had this guest on before and each time it's been, a vo- we've literally learned something new every five, ten minutes. So I thought, let's get Richard Sugg back again to talk about more disgusting things. But this time we're going to be talking about corpse magic, uh, mummies and human vampires. So Richard, welcome to the podcast again. How are you doing? Many thanks. Very well. Yeah, I'm hardened to disgusting. Did you say cannibalism? Yep. <laughs> okay, right. Anyway, um, moving on, I think we should uh, get past these pleasantries because we could sit here for hours and I'm interested now you said cannibalism. <laughs> it's on my, it's on my brain. Yeah. Richard, because you've come up with some of the coolest things. I mean, last, what was it, two pods before all we did was talk about poo. Uh, now we're talking about cannibalism. So I don't know which disgusting thing we're going to talk about next, but I'm looking through and it's looking pretty awesome. But let's Great. start with the... Let's let's start with the first question. So how common was cannibalism through the medieval and renaissance period in Europe? Easiest way to remember this in about one line or paragraph is that you get taught a lot, perhaps it's all about the first three Stuart kings, but you almost certainly don't get taught this. James I refused corpse medicine, which was cannibalism, and Charles II made his own corpse medicine. Charles I was made into corpse medicine. and by the time of Charles II, uh, who patented something called the King's Drop, distillation of human skull, uh, which was spreading by kind of snob value because they were the King's Drop, uh, but also he took routinely and on his deathbed in 1685. By this time, corpse medicine had been around for since the medieval period, um, but got into its heyday. And this is a crucial point we'll come back to, I think. The whole Quentin Tarantino getting medieval, however many times you say to people, this was at its height at the start of the scientific revolution. So Boyle, Willis were both involved in this, Charles II, uh, and it was probably going very strong in the early 18th century. However many times you say this, somebody will always insist that it's a medieval therapy. And it was just getting going in the Middle Ages, just getting going. But yeah, it was so common, medicinal cannibalism or corpse medicine. And in some cases, you don't have to actually kill somebody for the medicine because it might just involve blood uh, or, in fact, sweat or milk or hair uh, and so on. Um, But it was so common uh, that they started running out of Egyptian mummies, which were one big source of bodies for medicine. And the Egyptians started objecting to this after quite a lot of smuggling. and there was almost certainly fake mummy baked up in obscure fly-blown backstreet alleys in Cairo and thereabouts uh, by opportunistic merchants out of, I quote roughly, the flesh of dead lepers, beggars and camels. Uh, And in one further twist, which again we'll come back to, this was blamed on the Jews uh, who were supposed to be unscrupulously baking up this medicine, whereas the Jews were... uh, hardly involved in this at all they, they barely took corpse medicine so yeah the the great french uh, surgeon royal surgeon and amboise Paré, uh stated quite plainly that corpse medicine mummy particularly was the first and last of all our remedies in cases of bruising so you you don't always have to swallow it you fall off your horse uh, a surgeon comes by gets a plaster uh, with mummy on it and various other ingredients and clamps it to the bruise. And Paré uh, was a big, big surgeon, of course. He treated a nobleman called Des Ursins in the 1580s. And Des Ursins, I think, sort of fainted after falling off the horse. He wakes up and says to Paré, what have you done? Paré tells him, I didn't give you mummy because it doesn't work. I gave you this. And Des Ursins is 
like some patients, I want antibiotics. I want the real medicine. You know, is furious with Paré for not giving him the real stuff. Um, back a bit earlier in the 1530s, I think, Francis the first, perhaps a bit before that, was wont to carry mummy around with him in his purse in case he had a fall from a horse. So yeah, it's uh, it was everywhere. It was everywhere, and as we'll as we'll see, uh, one of the key questions was not should you eat people for medicine, uh, but what sort of person should you eat for medicine? And it got stranger, much stranger than Egyptian mummies, and probably more disgusting. Do you know what's going through my mind right now? I know it's really weird, and it's not a real story, but. For some strange reason, Sweeney Todd is popping up in my brain right now. You know, let's bake people for pies. Let's have a yeah, priest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So I'm going to move on because I think we're going to come back to sources of bodies in a minute. But what was the lamp of life? Because that sort of makes you think like the fountain of life, fountain of youth. But yeah, what, what was the, the the lamp of life? Yeah. So various characters in the 17th century, early to late, uh, including a German guy called Burgravius, but also interesting English character called Sir Christopher Irving, uh, who was the royal surgeon for some time, uh, proposed that if you put someone's blood into a lamp, so think of a typical oil lamp, and you lit it, uh, this was supposed to burn clearly and slowly if the person was in good health and was supposed to sparkle and languish if they were in bad health and would go out flatly if they died. I, I got very excited about this because I have such a lamp in the house, uh, which normally you, you light with oil. And uh, I asked my routine medical advisor, uh, Steve Schlossman from Harvard, uh, is this going to work? And was told, no, blood is mainly water. So forget this idea. But yeah, the idea circulated, and it, it's important actually in terms of what people believed about blood. The power of blood was something we've lost, we've forgotten really, and it had powers that were cosmic, that were divine, in fact. So you didn't I try it? Have, I haven't tried it, but I do have a photograph of the lamp with red wine in it, so I'll send you that. Well, let's do that. Steve can make a, a cartoon about that. <laughs> it's done. I think if we come back to Irvin for something else, because it's under a different question, really, he'll he'll come back. But uh, okay. yeah, that, that is the lamp of life. Don't try it at home. Uh, I uh, no, I don't think I'll be trying that this evening. Will you, Chris? Um, well, I might. There's nothing else going on. All by yourself at home alone. Try the lamp of life. <laughs> it's a Tuesday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's move on to the next question because I'm I'm edging to get to some of the others. So talking about mummies, let's let's stick with this this theme. How did Europeans go about getting mummies and corpses for medicine? So you've got two broad sources. Uh, the the key question, as I said, was not uh, should you eat people for medicine, but what sort of person should you eat? So it was either Egyptian mummies pretty much smuggled out of the burial tombs, which were getting opened up more and more in the 17th century. Uh, or it could be from North Africa, um, what they called white mummies, by which they meant, um, I think in contrast to the fact that an old mummy is brown, they meant people drowned in sandstorms, which happened quite a lot. And of course, in a very arid climate, my, uh, my uncle was in national service in Egypt. He said it never rained once. In this kind of climate, the body's got very light, very dry, it didn't rot. And so these white mummies from sandstorms were another source. Uh, but the broad split was between the very old, uh, non-visceral, uh, you know, not oozing or rotting, uh, very dry, friable, crumbly mummies, and the Paracelsian version. And the Paracelsians were big from the late 16th, increasingly through the 17th, centuries had a lot of power so you've got this split between old Galenic and new Paracelsian medicine and a lot of hard hitters for the Paracelsians who believed that you should get the body of a red-haired man uh, about 24 years of age dead of a violent death preferably hanging or drowning not hemorrhaging and all this mattered quite precisely uh, and you should prepare it with uh, aloes and myrrh uh, leave the flesh out under the moon for some time until it resembled smoke-cured meat without any stink. 
uh, and you could variously mash it up or you could prepare it into a tincture. So if you're ever offered something called aqua divina, which sounds very tasty and holy, uh, take it, take your precautions accordingly. Uh, I, just, I can't stop laughing. I'm so sorry. Chris is sitting there. My the people, second, no. <laughs> the second you said red-haired buzzard, Chris's face is gone. Oh, dear God almighty. Not me. Chris, you're too old. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Richard. Please continue while we cut you off and are now taking the piss out of Chris. and his, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's okay. Um, He needs to be cautioned about something. So, yeah, they're smuggling Egyptian mummies until I think it's about the mid 17th century. Egyptians get really fed up with it and that gets clamped down. You've then got the fake stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think they're getting bodies from graves. I mean, graves were very, very insecure, open, transient, of course, for a long time before the body snatching era. And one physician, Paracelsian physician, talks about uh, a recipe involving bones and said the bones should have not been should not be older than a year. And I think he talks about scraping the dirt from them. So you get the idea that they're robbing a marked grave. You need to know the age of the bones. You need to get the dirt off them. Anatomists also had access to bodies for uh, anatomies each year, whether legitimately or illegitimately. There were rumors of things going on with bodies which shouldn't have been happening. And in the 1680s, oh, I think it was, some kids were playing around the Grazing Road, knocked their ball into a pond and fishing it out. Uh, they came across what they thought was a wig and it turned out to be um, attached to an entire human skin, which had been dissected off the body with what looks like professional skill. So yeah, there were there were a lot of sources. Gibbets um, were objects of fascination around London. You've got them around Pancras Church uh, with one or two robbers uh, rotting patiently. When we get over to Europe, the uh, the bodies in gibbets could be there for over ten years, um, sitting, getting pecked by the the crows. And you've got bodies on uh, wheels. Vesalius, the great anatomist. Um, epitomizes the kind of dirty medicine we'll be talking about in a bit in the sense that he sneaked over the city walls of Louvain to rob a corpse from a gibbet so that he could get a skeleton, uh, boil it up to get a skeleton and learn to be one of the great icons of medical history uh, in this very grubby way. He would sit in a graveyard with friends blindfolded, betting them that he could guess which bone was which um, as they handed them to him, you know, sightless as it were. And uh, this was the man who had revolutionized anatomy, medicine, and, and much else. So, yeah, a lot of what seems to us now pretty shocking illegitimate sources, but graves were extremely insecure. In Europe, especially, there was a big fad for um, craniopsy that was um it wasn't the obscure and the helpless but it was the famous and the brilliant who wanted people wanted their skulls to see what skulls of geniuses look like so uh all sorts of people from beethoven to goya uh, ended up uh with the indignity of their skulls plundered and uh, and examined to see what brilliance looked like didn't um there's a goethe got to re regard schiller's um, skull. I think he wrote a poem about it. Um, if, if anyone's into German poetry, <laughs> that would, that would, that sounds like the same era. Yeah, that sounds like the same mm. thing going on a lot. I think Germany and Austria. I just but, want to um, add. Sorry, just before Chris uh, starts the next question, I think we can add osteoarchaeologists to this group of uh, weirdo people because <laughs> you meet an osteoarchaeologist and they can say, like for example, a friend of mine was a ballet dancer. And a friend, my friend who is an osteoarchaeologist said, oh, you must have been a ballet dancer. It's the way your bones do this. And I'm thinking, how do you know this stuff? That Oh, it's just the way you yeah. stand. It's the way you walk. And he said to me, you used to horse ride, didn't you? And I was like, have you been stalking me? But <laughs> apparently it's the way we sit, stand and everything else. They can tell so much from our bones. It's, yeah. it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I've heard this. Yeah. Yeah, spooky. So cannibalism, is, it's not just limited to Europe. There's some crazy stuff going on in the New World as well, isn't there? Yeah, well, this, of course, is the great irony, paradox, hypocrisy of the whole situation, that 
time and again in mummies, cannibals and vampires, you need to make the point that the real cannibals were surely the Europeans and they were denouncing the supposed or genuine cannibals of Brazil, Canada and so on in the Americas as pretty much the scum of the earth, basically. The word cannibal was actually a new word derived from Caribbean. And so it had a special kind of force of violence to it. And anybody you didn't like, you wanted to denounce in Europe or elsewhere, they were worse than the cannibals. Even the cannibals wouldn't do this and so on. And in terms of the genocide that was enacted by the Spanish in the New World, uh, one of the worst ever, the idea was that you could legitimately enslave cannibals or it was your duty to destroy the cannibals. So I think some cannibal tribes were invented, imagined and so on. And there was quite a bit of fantasy about this, but some of it really went on and it was broadly two forms. It was violent cannibalism, exo-cannibalism practiced by tribes time immemorial uh, against their enemies. So not only would you kill your enemies, but first you would capture them and in the case of the Tupanamba in Brazil, very interesting, long ritual, which got quite a lot of religious and honorable dimensions to it, insofar as you would uh, literally incorporate this victim in every sense. They spend a year married to one of your own tribe members. Uh, the wife would have a child with this um, outsider. And at the end of the year, after they'd lived, farmed, et, et cetera, with your tribe, you would kill them and eat them. And there were extremes of violence in a lot of these rituals, um, very prolonged, awful deaths. But at the same time, there was a sense of honor. There was a sense of seeing how the person behaved under these conditions and deciding they were worth eating uh, because of their courage. That might have been symbolic. It might have been actually magical in, in some senses. The other big, big uh, one, which people like Raleigh and others were aware of, was funerary cannibalism or endocannibalism within the tribe. And this was going on probably to the 1960s in at least one part of Brazil, a tribe called the Wari, studied by Beth Conklin. And the Wari would have a whole kind of system of ritual. They would burn the dead person's house. They would color and anoint the body. They would use feathers. Uh, in the ritual, they would eat the flesh with special splints of wood as a form of cutlery, which they didn't normally do when they ate anything else. And the whole thing was very, very deeply religious. The dead, the dying person would expect to be eaten, they would want to be eaten. Uh, and when people talked to some of these endo cannibals about burial and shouldn't you bury your dead, shouldn't you burn them, they were horrified. The idea of burial particularly was polluting was dank, lonely, disgusting. And for the worry, probably for others, uh, it was a form of mourning and it was a form of transition. It was a form of uh, managing grief, if you like. Uh, Consuming grief is the title of Conklin's book. And yeah, they, they treated this with great reverence. And if it was a particular, I think, a sort of senior tribe member, the body would have to wait quite a while before they ate it. And at times they would be forcing down flesh, so putrid it made them nauseous, actually perhaps made them vomit. There's no question of appetite, but a very strong kind of religious ritual uh, involved in this. I want to vomit. Does that count right now? Yum, yum. It is quite an interesting inverse, though, because like with the Franklin expedition that went missing there, and then there was uh, the accusation that um, that the sailors turned to cannibalism and British society was completely horrified at the idea that British sailors would start eating each other. Yeah, I, I think it's it's in the um it's in the life of Pi book, isn't it? Because the guy on the boat, oh Lord, what's his name? He he's named after somebody who got it, didn't he, in a famous case. Mm. Uh which, which, you know, went to court, went to trial. And then because it was considered the unwritten law of the sea, that this happened actually a lot. Uh, and sometimes people cast lots through straws to see who was going to get eaten. Uh, yeah, they, they actually pardoned them uh, in, in the end. Um, the name's going to come to me in a moment, but one of the yeah. famous <laughs> British cases. But, but an awful lot. When I got into this, what I realised was actually they didn't always eat people. 
they tended to drink their blood actually an awful lot of the time and it was mm. done quite rigorously with a ship surgeon perhaps yeah that's that's a whole other one if you want something else disgusting i've got reams of appalling shipwreck stories um through the yeah, i'm all over that i was gonna say <laughs> chris is gonna be so excited if we can do ship things but it's a, it's a good point actually to raise that because the, the one I missed out was famine cannibalism because both um, medicinal cannibalism and um, you know new world inverted commas savage cannibalism were ritual and religious really but famine cannibalism was kind of brute necessity and one of my favourite moments in this whole crazy saga is the missionaries bringing over some chupin amber to France uh, in about the 1570s or 80s. And the uh, cannibals were just absolutely thunderstruck at this mess because, of course, it's the middle of the wars of religion. Um, the city of Rouen, which I think is where they are, has just been forcibly wrested from German armies. The place is devastated. The king at the time happens to be about 10 years old. Uh, and also they're just struck by the routine appalling inequality. It's a bit like if you brought the cannibals over to Brexit Britain and showed them this utter shit show. That is government, you know, with 31% of kids in poverty, 18% uh, food inflation, and old people so cold they ride around on buses all day to keep warm. Um, they just thought, what the hell are you trying to sell us here? You know, um, if we lived here, we would take the rich people by the throats and burn their houses. So that didn't go down so well for the missionaries. Um, there was also a guy called Jean Delery who lived with the cannibals, uh, with I think it was the Chupinamba, for quite some time, and he found that. Uh, like the mafia and academics, cannibals only kill their own. Uh, so he was quite safe and well treated in his time there. But he came back to France, where the wars of religion had just ravaged Sancerre, one of the worst famines uh, in, in that century. And he was confronted by a starving family where the grandmother had persuaded the father and mother to eat their dead baby, which had died of starvation. Uh, and he spontaneously vomited out the site, having survived New World cannibalism for I think at least a year until then. And let's stick with this idea of Europe because I'm now quite interested in knowing who the savage tribes of Europe were. Yes, yeah, so there was quite a bit of uh, exo cannibalism and blood drinking during the French Revolution. This is probably the uh, better known stuff, I think. Uh, but if we go back to um, Hungary in the 16th century, this was a particularly oppressive society. Um, some listeners will probably know that this uh, was the home of Elizabeth Bathory later on, uh, one of the biggest serial killers of all time. And Earlier on, in 1514, there'd been a popular uprising and the Hungarian nobility had crushed it and decided to make an example of the rebellion's leader, uh, Georg Dotsa. So they had an iron throne and crown made for Dotsa. His imprisoned foot soldiers were starved for two weeks. Uh, some of them simply perished, but some were half alive, um, mad with hunger, when on 20th of July, 1514, the nobles instructed their gypsy executioners to make a fire under the iron throne until it was white hot. Uh, they had a white hot iron crown for Dotsa, the symbolic peasant king. Uh, they put him on the white hot iron throne. They put the white hot iron crown on his head uh, and they forced or allowed, I don't know, his starving soldiers to eat his roasted flesh. And on it went and it got worse. The uh, 17th century, 16th century, from the Reformation onwards, um, I don't think this is taught very much if at all in schools, but this was an era of staggering violence between two branches of the same religion. And I think for you know context, when people get uh, upset about Muslims and examples of terrorism across the Islamic Christian divide. They need to know that the Christians managed to kill possibly up to a third of the population of continental Europe. Uh, you've got the 30 years war, the 80 years war, the 100 years war. Uh, and in France again, uh, just after the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre, which claimed perhaps thousands of lives, 
after they're trying to reconcile Protestants and Catholics. Uh, in the aftermath of this in Ox there, uh, one uh, Protestant was executed and his heart was actually auctioned off before it was roasted and eaten by the, the lucky winner. This kind of thing was probably going on under the radar sporadically, and given the extremes of violence and hatred that Protestant Catholic uh, warfare involved. But we know for sure that in the Piedmont Valleys in the late 17th century, uh, soldiers went crazy uh, when they were suppressing uh, particular Protestant sects there. Uh, these were Catholic soldiers, but the violence was actually reported by a Catholic soldier as well. And yeah, people were not only killed, but eaten quite impromptu, roasted on uh, pikes and so forth in these episodes. There was also just a routine kind of outside of warfare habit of noble revenge feuds. And it was really just within the aristocracy. You know, you had to be aristocratic to deserve to be dragged around the square on the back of a horse, um, hacked to pieces, and then have your liver munched a little bit just for good measure by one of your rival nobles. Um, again, you know, very honorable. They would only kill their own. And if you're a mere peasant, you, you probably didn't deserve that unless you dared to uprise uh, against them. But yeah, the, the savagery of the um, European aristocracy had a, had a kind of religious force to it. Again, it, it was lingered on, I think, in mafia killings in you know, our lifetime. But little known stuff which which was smoldering across Europe and blazing out um, you know within Christianity as a as an act of piety I suppose that's an important thing to bear in mind you know, this was a fiercely ideological fiercely religious kind of violence yeah um, talking about things that wipe out a third of European population uh, I'm going to bring up the plague because why not it's awesome but as medicine's evolving we kind of get dirty medicine what is it and how, how was it used during the plague? Yeah, so the plague, of course, threw up all sorts of remedies, which now look crazy. Uh, one of my favourite was, um, was the chicken cure, where you would take your live chicken, uh, pluck a bare spot on it. You would then hold this bare spot to the plague sore. And the logic was that the chicken would suck out the plague spirits. So what you would do um, was take your first chicken, wait till it died, possibly of irritation, anger, embarrassment, shock, who knows, because it had its feathers plucked off. Uh, and then you would keep going through various chickens until you got to one that didn't die, uh, perhaps it was particularly hardy or shameless. And that meant that all the plague spirits had been sucked out of your, your sores. And this idea of spirits actually as a, as a vessel for conveying all sorts of things. Is, is a big crucial force in the book. But yeah, there were also a handful of Paracelsian physicians, a guy called Edward Bolnest, hanging around in plague stricken London when the royal court, I should emphasize, far from honoring any kind of spirit of the Blitz, were just fleeing from London to Winchester to Salisbury as fast as it could. Um, but these, these physicians, perhaps a bit like some kind of modern nurses who never, never caught COVID in conditions where you should catch it several times. For some reason they were immune and they would be there uh, on hand with some remedy made from the corpse of your young red-headed man, uh, probably mashed up uh, with tremendous violence into, uh, in some cases, a tincture, which you could swallow fairly easily if you didn't know where it came from. And yeah, it was, a, it was a very, very dirty world in terms of the diseases you suffered, in terms of the medicine that treated them. Epilepsy was pretty much an epic one for having to swallow just about anything a physician could throw at you. Uh, maggots from the nose of a rotting sheep, uh, earthworms during coitus, I think it was your coitus, not theirs, uh, and every bit of foulness you can imagine. And we'll get to human blood in a little bit. Uh, toward the end as well. But one thing that struck me doing this book and also then turning it into the history of disgust, which is out very shortly, was that our sense of disgust uh, is founded on boundaries and what can get into your body, what can get near you, what yourself and your body can keep at a distance. So when you had something like, you know, 
yards and yards of tapeworms in your gut routinely, when the disgusting things already inside you, uh, it's not so easy to be disgusted. I think people were pretty hardened to a lot of very, very filthy medicine and pretty much every form of excrement, urine, animal, human, bird, you name it, was part of the whole scientific mess of the, uh, the pharmacopoeia for a very, very long time through to the 18th century. I think Chris is sitting there thinking, thank God I'm alive right now and not back then because I would have been sacrificed. And thank God you weren't a descendant of Charles II, as various people like to boast, because um, one story that illustrates the kind of complete lack of squeamishness I think people had to have, you know, there's no anaesthetics, there's no refrigeration for corpses and so on. But Pepys was hearing a story in the 1660s that one of the queen's, uh, sorry, one of the king's mistresses, and there were many, of course, uh, as somebody once said uh, very piously, Charles was a father to his people, with somebody whispering sotto voce, I and a great many of them. Um, this mistress suddenly gave birth, was kind of caught short, uh, a court entertainment, actually seemed to not know she was pregnant, bizarrely. The child was still born, and Charles II got hold of it uh, as quickly as he could and dissected it. Uh, for the um, edification of himself and I think various witnesses. He was quite a keen viewer of anatomies in general. And the fact is that not only was this a stillborn baby, but there's a good chance that it was his own son. So yeah, people were, were pretty hardened to what would seem intolerable nowadays. Harvey performed autopsies on his own father. And I think it was his sister uh, way, way back before that. I don't really know where to go with this. My face, if anybody's been watching, Chris has been laughing because I've just sat there with the most horrific looks on my face as he's been talking. Face on the cover of my history of disgust. Yes, perfect. I think my face, every time we meet, I think my face has this permanent look of horror on it. <laughs> just, we, we, can, we, can, we can elevate things now because I think we're due for the soul in a moment. So we can. We, can get we the are. White light. I'm a little bit concerned here because is it going to get worse or is it going to get better when we're talking about eating souls? Because when you think of like a soul eater, I don't know, you think of a demon or something along those lines. I don't know. Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I going in the you're, wrong direction? You're partly, you're partly right, but it's it's worse than that as well, actually. Yeah. Oh, dear God. Okay. I think just, yeah, let's, let's just go into it. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the religious dimension of this, um, particularly for the Protestants, was founded on an idea that the something called the animate corpse meant that in northern Europe the body didn't just kind of switch off, which is a roughly our modern belief of death. You know, it kind of switches off. You're alive or you're dead. But for most people in most of history, from the Bible through to probably various places in the world now, you were alive, you were dead, and in between you were slightly dead. You were slightly dead for three days. You were slightly dead for 40 days. And you were slightly dead for up to a year. And the force of the soul, the force of life smoldered on in the body for up to a year. In one case, actually, for up to seven years, allegedly. And uh, this meant that the body was worth eating. This was the basis of the Paracelsian idea that you wanted the body of a young, red-headed man, dead of a violent death, preferably of drowning or uh, hanging, not of hemorrhage. So the idea was that the soul was carried in the blood, it was carried in spirits, and none of these spirits of plague coming out in the poor old chicken. It was carried in these spirits of the blood, the hottest, finest parts of the blood. And if you trapped this in the body of a healthy young man uh, who hadn't died of disease, who had the right kind of blood, which was why he had red hair, then you could essentially consume a soul. Uh, there's a guy called Gocklinius, German physician, who believed that in a hanging, the hanging actually conditions the spirits of the blood and therefore the soul, and they were trapped in the skull, and they kind of fertilized, inseminated, marinated the skull for up to seven years, so that when you think you're kind of consuming a dry bone or you're distilling uh, dry bone matter into the king's drops. Actually, no, you've you've allegedly got the brain kind of marinated up there, and the finest, highest spirits of the body. Uh, it's kind of rule of three goes from the liver to the heart to the brain. You've got the spirits of the soul 
uh, traps there in the skull for you to harvest after seven years uh, later. So yeah, it was worth eating. You didn't want a crummy animal body. You wanted the masterpiece of creation uh, with a divine soul in it. And the, the logic of hanging um, had a kind of rough sort of scientific status because as you may know, um, just after John Major came up with his Back to Basics morality campaign, Chris might remember this, um, uh, it was a delightful period in British politics because all this kind of bullshit uh, Tory ethics about the family and all the rest of it, Tory ministers were falling over themselves to have affairs and ordinary affairs were the mild stuff because the best one was the MP for, oh God, Eastleigh in Southampton. Can't remember his name, it's perhaps just as well. But he was found dead in women's underwear with an orange in his mouth, uh, having strangled himself in some autoerotic game uh, just after the Back to Basics came, glorified uh, campaign, glorified Britain. And the logic of hanging for um, people watching these things in the open air in the early modern period was that, well, something radical is happening to the felon. It was almost always a man. Uh, and he could sustain an erection. So this again depends on the spirits. If you think about Shakespeare's sonnet about sex, uh, the expense of spirits in a way to exchange. He's talking about the fact that everybody knows spirits are crucial to the hydraulics, the whole orgasm mechanism of, of the male body. And if you could then traumatize, terrify, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the body that you were going to eat, that you were going to prepare for medicine, then you'd actually conditioned the spirits of the soul into their most kind of highly boiled, powerful form. And yeah, hey presto, you've got the best soul medicine that you could imagine. Um, I said we'd come back to Christopher Irving, the, the royal surgeon who uh, was interested in the lamp of life. And Irving flirts more than once with the idea that ideally you want your flesh for corpse medicine not just from a fresh young body, but if you can, you want it and blood from a living body. He says this at least uh, twice. And the idea is that uh, if you can get live spirits, this is better than, than anything else. So yeah, deeply, mysteriously uh, religious and very Protestant most of the time. Uh, form of cannibalism going on here. Um, what it lacked was the the honourable dimensions of um, new world cannibalism, because there was no reverence whatsoever for these these bodies that you were plundering, mutilating, uh, pulverising, and, and selling. And yeah, swallowing. The next question I have to say, I have never been described as a masterpiece of creation. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just outrageous. I'm, I'm glad we've put something right, if nothing else has been. <laughs> I have to put that in my bio, in my, in a bio somewhere. <laughs> but all, all this is, is is quite extreme, and it might just be a twenty first century mentality. But surely there must have been some kind of opposition for uh, to the usage of uh, corpses and bodies like this. There, there was there was almost none that's on record. There was a character in the fifteen eighties who talked about the plundering of Egyptian mummies uh, from North Africa and. He stated that these are the dead bodies which physicians make us to swallow. So you get that sense of people being cowed by medical authority, not very happy about it, but these are meds, these are medics, these are physicians, they've they've got our best interests at heart. So it's that doctor, you know, treating you sternly for your own good. Um, one of the early opponents or critics of it was Montaigne, who was deeply untypical, as you'll probably know of of most of his contemporaries. And Montaigne criticized the um, uh, denunciation of New World cannibals, saying that in the wars of religion, you know, people have done far worse than that. They've torn people to pieces with dogs. Uh, they've ate each other. And well, you know, we use it for medicine. So he says this in, I think, the 1580s. Uh, but he's very much uh, an almost alone voice. There's a handful of others in the 16th century, pretty much, you know, on the fingers of one hand. Um, in the 17th century, it's interesting because you have a character called Sir Thomas Brown, who funnily enough had his skull end up in the museum in Norwich after he 
lamented in his life the horrible things that our enemies might do to our bodies after death. And Brown stated around 1650 um, that mummy has become merchandise. Mummy has become merchandise with this sense of having degraded it by putting it through the kind of rough machinery of commerce and medicine and trade. And mummy turns up in a trade dictionary in about, I think, 20 languages at one point. So this sense that you've got too close to irreverent with something once mysteriously divine, and they were deeply envious of the techniques of embalming the Egyptians had. Uh, then you get interesting phase in the kind of knockabout comedies of the restoration, the typical kind of where's my trousers, um, old man after a young woman sort of farces that you had. And over and over again, they've got two uses for mummy. One is I'll beat you into mummy. So it was the version of I'll beat you to a jelly. And the other was um, you're as old and disgusting as mummy, this being a poor young, you know, Miriam or Charlotte has been after by this wretched old man. Um, so the, the aged became as dry and antique and irreverently dusty as mummies. And there was this interesting violence that recurs, I'll beat you into mummy, uh, the sense that physicians have been pounding these bits of flesh or uh, Egyptian mummy up into medicine for a long time. And this has demystified them again. Um, the, the sense of the aged as mummy means that, yeah, mummy is no longer uh, reverently ancient. It's just commonplace, you know, matter out of place, old people trying to mess about with young people. And then after sort of literature getting ahead of the game a bit here, it blows up in the middle of the 18th century. So it's still going strong in the early 18th century. And it's certainly not gone away by the end of the century, but in the middle, we get Dr. Johnson's dictionary, 1755. And despite not having an entry for sausage, it does not, it does have entries. <laughs> It does. It sorry, does. I'm so sorry. It's an just, outrage. It's I'm watching Chris's face. One of the greatest, greatest contributions <laughs> to, to world cuisine given us by Britain, and it's it's not in there. I mean, someone as someone as full of appetite as Dr. Johnson, you know, you think you'd remember the sausage. There was actually an entry for it in about 1611, I think. Uh, that the English sausage sounds very tasty in that description. But yeah, Johnson talks this about- This to make pork. a joke. I'm so sorry. Is, is he eating sausages? Is Chris eating sausages in the he's, middle of the show? He's sitting Again. there and I can see his face and I know he wants to make some sort of joke. I think we should allow, no, he doesn't want to make a, is it a dirty joke, Chris? Um, yes. <laughs> you can make a dirty joke. No, I haven't quite formulated it yet. There's something about um, tasty English sausage and swallowing down a redhead man and I want to put the two together and it's not... I think you need, you need black adder in there as well, don't you? You need uh, the, the horse's willy in there. The horse <laughs> <laughs> He's made that horse's willy last for a lot of, all day. <laughs> Sorry, Richard, keep going. I'm no, so... that was... that was I, I, I'm fond of black adder. I was there first time around. Um, so, yeah, where were we? Um, opposition. Yeah, um, Johnson and uh, a mate of his called Robert James and another mate called uh, John Hill. Uh, interesting trio in starting to demolish corpse medicine. So Johnson denounces um, mummy and uh, the moth of the skull and human skull as horrid medicines. But he takes this description from Hill. And Hill was um, a sometime physician and an actor. And what's interesting here is that, again, the English stage had got ahead of um, mainstream medicine, if you like, because there were plays from 1717, I think it was, through the 18th century, where you've either got a character called Dr. Mummy, or you've got Mummy on the stage. And the whole thing becomes a kind of slapstick farce, but quite sharply angled towards the fact that people don't like physicians. Um, they're greedy, they're cruel, they're callous, they're uncaring. And yeah, the medical profession decides um, in the light of this, having been publicly shamed on the common stage more than once, that it had better clean up its act. And part of cleaning up its act is to distance itself from mummy. So uh, Robert James is a bit of an ironic figure for this because he was, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you'd quite call him a charlatan, but he was drunk for the last 20 years of his life, um, constantly treating noble patients, 
uh, full of brandy or gin or whatnot, very good at concealing it. He was a mate of Dr. Johnson's and um, he was he was one for the ladies. Um, he had to pay for it. But uh, he once picked up Dr. Johnson in his carriage with his latest prostitute, uh, which Dr. Johnson objected was the most indecent and uh, undignified for them at their age, uh, at which James admitted, yes, it was. But if I do not have a woman every six weeks, my ballot swells so I cannot keep them in my trousers. And if you, if you can't trust a doctor on that diagnosis, I suppose, who can you trust? But James, along with this, was... Uh, a great kind of medical plutocrat. He made a fortune out of something called James's fever powders, which was probably rubbish, but was still in Queen Victoria's medical chest a lot later. So James, who actually prescribed corpse medicine at times, uh, decided that, yeah, um, other things work just as well. And there's no reason uh, that a physician should disgrace his profession by association with this. Um, others started to decide that, well, it doesn't work either. And this is interesting because there's the kind of invention of disgust by the gentility and particularly by women, which we've gone over before. But there's also now a kind of new model of the body. So where the body was kind of divinely galvanized by this vital force of spirits of the soul firing through it, doing everything from erections to sight to pain to sensation, uh, next, you get this mechanical body coming from Descartes and being refined through the 18th century. And the mechanical body with this kind of sense of clockwork uh, doesn't really need anything to fire it and galvanize it and power it. So they kind of, it's a bit of a, a shifty business because they've been looking for the soul in the body for a long, long time in the Latin is. Uh, is it in the brain? Is it in the heart? Is it in the liver? And they finally decide, well, we're not finding it. We're not finding anything different. If anything, animals have got more impressive structures than we have. And they give up the search for the soul. So once you decide the soul isn't in the body in the way that it was for a long time, well, the body isn't worth eating for medicine anymore. Um, and something that we think is very, very ancient, and kind of associated with Hippocrates and the Hippocratic Oath, uh, the medical profession is very, very new. It was just slowly deciding to clean up its act uh, in the mid 18th century, but it wasn't really named as a concept until the, the early 19th century. A guy called Percival uh, came up with the idea of medical ethics then. So yeah, kind of fourfold uh, reasons for driving corpse medicine back into the past. Uh, the fourth being that Quentin Tarantino sense of getting medieval. And this fascinates me, you know, why the Middle Ages are kind of the absolute past to us. I mean, is it because the painting was so bad, they have flat faces? Uh, is it because the language is so weird, it doesn't sound like English? Is it because the Americans invented the idea of getting medieval? And if America didn't really exist in the medieval period, well, hey, you know, um, so many kind of strange questions about this. But certainly the Enlightenment in Europe uh, was ferocious in driving all these disgusting remedies back into this absolutely medieval and therefore Catholic past uh, and told flat lies, you know, constantly about, oh, they used to use the moss of the skull in the Middle Ages. I mean, to, to make this point clear, um, they were using the moss of the skull uh, in the time of Johnson and probably after his death, uh, insofar as in the 1780s, so time of George III, there was an import and export tax on skulls smuggled from Ireland into Britain for medicine, an export tax on human skulls. Uh, that means they were profitable. They were a big item of trade. So, yeah, it, it goes on through the 18th century, but you can see the turning point with Johnson uh, around about the middle. I mean, does cannibalism stop at all? So you hear in the news sometimes that some weirdo person is a cannibal and they've eaten seven people and you found their heads in a fridge. But in general, does it stop within society? Oh, so the medicinal version stops much later than you might think. And we'll come to the human vampires, which I suppose you could class as cannibalism uh, in a moment. But the basically what happened really was that the educated privileged elite decided that corpse medicine was disgusting, was barbaric, was superstitious, was Catholic. It wasn't Catholic, it was thoroughly Protestant, but they decided that they weren't going to have it anymore. And what they did was completely fail to offer any alternative to 
about 90 odd percent of the population who just carried on if they could. So it was hardly getting hold of your materials. But yeah, people in Wales, in England, in Scotland were probably fairly routinely, and we have a lot of documented instances, getting hold of skulls, particularly uh, to get hold of a body was perhaps part of a skull. It sits there for a long time. Uh, graves get turned over because you need space for somebody new and so on. So yeah, you would get the skull, you would grate it a little bit, you would put some powder from it into a drink for your uh, child or relative who was suffering from fits that might mean epilepsy. Uh, and this is very soothing grating skull. We had a skull in uh, the Channel 4 sh showing with uh, Tony Robinson and um, you get your little cheese grater and you grate it. And Tony found it quite therapeutic. Um, but yeah, skulls as drinking vessels in Scotland, early 20th century, um, non-cannibalistic, but to us pretty gruesome uses of the human body. So whenever there was a public hanging, uh, and there were public hangs until I think the 1860s, people were clamoring around in crowds. And I think this was quite British because foreign witnesses were pretty staggered by some pretty young girl who'd got some skin problem, getting the dead man's hand and sort of brushing it over her breast. And you have these sort of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe ideas of this man who's not quite dead and his last uh, sensation before he jets off into eternity uh, is this beautiful woman brushing his dying hand over her body to cure some, some skin complaint. And after the public hanging stopped, or as an alternative, anybody that died of drowning was out, laid out in public in an inn by the riverside, etc. Uh, for a little while, there were people clamoring to to touch the corpse. I think quite a lot of the time with the idea that you could give your disease to the corpse, very basic ancient medical idea, which is almost certainly there in the cures of Christ. You could actually give um, your disease to somebody else. So uh, a lot of strange and gruesome things going on. Corpse magic, which Chris invoked uh, earlier on, was kind of what corpse medicine turned into. It sort of decayed in an oozing, picturesque, gothic fashion through the 19th century into the early 20th. And the best ones to remember are the hand of glory, mummified hand, uh, which you would use as a thief. Uh, and ideally you would have not just this hand, but a candle made from human fat. And with this lit, clutched somehow in the hand of glory, you could go with impunity into any uh, nocturnal house. It would either stun them into sleep or keep them asleep uh, so that you could burgle uh, and rob at your leisure. And it was believed that these flames of the, the hand or the candle, I think, could only be put out with milk. And yeah, murders were committed across Europe uh, in the late 19th century for the sake of human fat many, many times. So the medical version took a long time to go away. The other versions, I think, unfortunately, are never quite going to go away. There's this famine cannibalism in all sorts of circumstances. There's exo cannibalism uh, in, you know, warfare versions of it. You hear about American soldiers having severed fingers in their, their lockers. They're not eating them, but it's got a similar kind of psychology to it. And you hear about people drinking the blood of their enemies in modern conflicts a few years ago. Um, psychopathic cannibalism, it, it, it's always going to surprise us. Uh, the, the German case of Armin News and Bernd Jürgen Brandes um, has uh, become legendary. And I, in fact, was in communication with a few students from Durham, where I used to lecture, uh, who were actually putting on a play about this. I mean, fair play to them for attempting that. I don't know how. How they managed to adapt it for uh, for modern viewing, full of trigger warnings, no doubt. Um, but yeah, you know, tricky legal case because, well, the guy said he wanted to be eaten. You know, he all but signed the contract. And uh, the psychology of that was was interesting when he talks about um, every bit of brandies that he gets out of the freezer because he keeps eating for a long time after he's actually dead. Um, he says he gets closer and closer to him, I think. And there's a little bit of the, the, the psychology of endocannibalism and the, the funerals perhaps there as well. But um, yeah, I think the, the kind of psychopathic weird stuff, um, the stuff of psychoanalysts is probably the main stuff now, but it's 
it's perhaps never going to quite go away, unfortunately. As a former Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, can we talk about human vampires? Yes, yes. The the, the very earliest um, Catholic, in fact, uh, 13th century uh, medicinal cannibalism that we know about, when it hadn't really got going in terms of Egyptian mummies, but uh, people vaunted in the history of religion and the history of science, Albertus Magnus, who would become a saint, uh, Roger Bacon, both of these characters and a Spaniard called Arnold de Villanova uh, in, I think it was all of them in the 13th century, were distilling uh, human blood. So very much this kind of alchemy, which uh, pious, often monastic scientists were practicing. And they swore time and time again that distillations of human blood, the water of human blood, the fire of human blood, as they would term them, roused people pretty much from their deathbed. Um, in 1679, one Franciscan uh, monk and apothecary gave a recipe, recipe for jam, whereby you would dry the substance uh, very rigorously, cut it with a knife, uh, stir it again into a batter, dry it, sieve it, uh, seal it up in a jar, renew it in the spring of each year. And this was all made from blood. Um, but the big, big human vampires were mainly at the beheadings in Europe. Um, when I said that Charles I was made his corpse medicine, that's what I mean roughly. Uh, people came away from his beheading with handkerchiefs, which they expected would cure the king's evil using, using his blood. But the big drinking um, was going on in Denmark, uh, Austria, Germany, occasionally in Italy, uh, surprisingly, because these were hangings, but they would open the veins. But the executioner and his servant, we've been talking today to the TV crew who are going to make uh, a film about a day in the life of a German executioner called Franz Schmidt, who left his diaries and all sorts of fascinating details. And the executioner had the right financially to all the body parts of the condemned. Uh, so they would sell strips of flesh as leather for pregnant women. Human fat was a big one, uh, but probably the biggest one, and certainly the most spectacular, was human blood. Uh, in Copenhagen, Mary Wollstonecraft saw people coming back from blood drinking, uh, beheading. Uh, in Denmark, Hans Christian Andersen saw it. I think he was still a child. It was a nice sort of family outing to take your eight-year-old child to the beheading in those days and uh, instill in them some sense of morality perhaps. And Germany and Austria were very, very big for this. Uh, funnily enough, Sir Thomas Brown, we bumped into earlier, his son was out in Vienna in, I think, the 1660s, and he saw a man and a woman, both beheaded. You would sit them in a chair and the head was struck off while they sat there. Uh, he watched blood and steam shooting into the frosty Viennese air. It was winter time. And he noticed that somebody ran up to drink blood from the body of the man. The logic here being that the man is far more worth eating. All sorts of wonderful prejudices about female souls at this time. Uh, he's worth eating, whereas the woman on the whole isn't. And time and time again, you hear um, people running up to a body, tipping it over, drinking the blood from the neck. Uh, the orderly version is cups handed out by the executioner's servants. You pay for this in advance. Uh, you fill the cups, perhaps they fill the cups for you. Drink the blood as hot as you can. And then, this is a repeated prescription, you run as fast as you can, or you're dragged very fast by horses. And as you'll probably know, in the early modern period, people didn't run for their amusement or health. They ran if someone was chasing them. Or in this case, they ran, I think, because... They were getting iron toxicity. So this can cause convulsions, confusion, and at the further end, death, uh, depending on how much blood, how big you are, and so on. So I think they were trying to burn off this ferocious shot of concentrated energy, uh, potentially poison. But also, in their logic, they were trying to circulate the spirits of the dying person around their own spirits and souls. So run fast, you know, it makes sense that this is going to agitate your whole mechanism and sort of suck all this medicine into the bits where it's needed. And this went on as the music of Bach gave way to that of Haydn, to Mozart, to Strauss, to Chopin. It went on until at least 1865 in Germany. It had interesting variations whereby 
in Denmark at one point, two girls rushed up to the beheaded body, uh, plucked some blood away from it with cups and drank it, were apprehended by the police. And then these, these were teenage girls, apparently, uh, told the police, no, look, we've got a paper from the dead man who gave it to us uh, and signed it saying we could drink his blood after he was dead. And Sweden was uh, an interesting case in this respect because almost nobody was ever executed in Sweden. Uh, whether they were bad at catching them or they were very law abiding, there were very few executions. When there was one, there was an absolute mob of people. You would get 500 people camping out the night before the execution. They would then go to the scaffold with cups, bowls, glasses, and I quote, saucepans, um, to get the precious blood, either to live forever, to cure epilepsy, various magical purposes. The problem was that in Sweden, you were not allowed the blood of the felon. This was allowed countenance, sanctioned in Germany, in Austria, in Denmark, but not in Sweden. So you had soldiers forcing you back. You had up to 200 people injured in the scrum for the blood once the head came off. And in the second case of this, in 1866, uh, precisely in an era when the great white empires of Europe are denouncing the savage blood drinking rights of Africa, a place called Dahomey in particular, precisely then, this was the scene that occurred in Sweden uh, after an execution. These soldiers got between the crowd and the body. Uh, they then plowed earth over the blood to further deter the uh, patients, as it were, and people at the front of the crowd fell to their knees and crammed blood-soaked earth into their mouths, which I think is probably the opening scene we want in the ultimate documentary on this, when we try and establish who were the real savages in the, the age of great white imperial improvement. So yeah, uh, gallons of blood being drunk in uh, Europe, and I think Europeans were relatively hardened to it by the the look of one American witness who clearly wasn't hardened to it and was thunderstruck by people covered in blood, somebody tipping the body over again, drinking from the trunk, uh, and so forth. American artist, painter called John Ross Brown described this, I think, 1858, and uh, yeah, one of the latest, um, longest running cures and again based powerfully in the belief that you can swallow the soul and particularly if you're epileptic epilepsy is a disease epilepsy is a disease of the soul in this period and uh, you need to help the soul to cure it so richard as always this has been really really interesting and horrifying at the same time <laughs> it's, a, it's a really Thanks. strange <laughs> no it's great it's just it's, it's a really it's really quite thought-provoking uh, like you said the, the comparison of you know we always hold ourselves up as uh, Europe being the civilized ones, but are yeah. we any better, if not worse? Yeah. But um, what, what the, what's uh, this is part of your history of discuss series. Um, wh when's this one um out? Yeah, so the genesis of this uh is Mummies, Cows, and Vampires is out. It's worth giving a heads up to any interested readers. There's three editions. Don't mess around with the Routledge ones. I was very pleased with those, but they cost about thirty five pound paperback. Uh, you want the new edition, much more horror for much less money. Um, comes in at, I think, about £10, black cover, white lettering. And that really is up to date. I mean, that covers some of the horrors of the organ black market in China, which I'm, I'm afraid I'm about horrifying afraid. anything we've talked about. But yeah, this, this gave rise to the history of disgust because I realised when researching very dirty medicine that in this period, when everything was so disgusting, you couldn't really be uh, afford to be disgusted. Shakespeare never used the word, as I think we said before. And it struck me that, well, when did it get invented in our modern sense? So I foolishly decided I had to have a chapter on Brexit, Johnson, uh, the filth that is the Tory party, the open sewer uh, that is the uh, Sunak cabinet with its 65% of public school kids drawn from 6% of the nation's schools to rule justly over us. Um, and that is nearly finished. It has been rough. It has been hard work. Um, but uh, I just pretty much need to wrap up format, cover, uh, and it should be there early May with a bit of luck. Uh, Talking Dirty, the history of disgust from Jesus Christ to Boris Johnson, no prizes given. Don't be a bit.
Cool. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we can, between us, we, we talk quite regularly, we should uh, see if we can come up with another disgusting subject to drag Alina through at some point in the future. That would be great. It's, it's worth it for, for the face. Yeah. <laughs> very funny, Absolutely. gentlemen. Very funny. Oh, yeah, I forgot you were still here. Uh, <laughs> But, but um, thanks, Richard. Thanks, as always, for coming on. Thanks. It's been great. It's been a great time. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books. You can support them and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.